Okay, good afternoon. My name is Rich Penny. This talk is called Moral Agency in a Free Market Economy. This presentation will demonstrate the subtle ways in which market economics affects human psychology and explore the issue of choice and responsibility in light of these influences. Part one, the psychological influences of market economics. It's important to understand that capitalism is not just an outgrowth of human psychology. Rather, it shapes human psychology. It dictates our priorities. Capitalism is not a byproduct of selfishness. Rather, the excessively selfish behavior that we see all the time is an inevitable consequence of living in a capitalist economy. Let me give you an example. The Google self-driving car. Right now, this little guy has driven over 700,000 miles without a single accident. According to the Federal Highway Administration of the United States, the average American drives roughly 16,500 miles every year. All state insurance estimates that the average person has an accident roughly every 10 years or 165,000 miles. This means that the Google self-driving car has already done better than the average person four times over. In addition to this fact, this car will save thousands of lives through decreased accidents and it will improve conditions for people living with a disability. So, that being the case, with the understanding that morals and ethics are about concern for other people, the moral choice here becomes clear. Let's implement this technology as quickly as possible and improve people's lives. However, whenever I raise this point with friends, with family, with coworkers, I am always confronted with a series of questions. Number one, who's going to insure it? Number two, who's liable if it gets into an accident? Number three, what happens to all the people who make their money, make their living off of various transportation jobs, and now what happens to them when cars and trucks start driving themselves? What this illustrates is what Peter Joseph talks about when he says that the monetary sequence of value has decoupled from the life sequence of value. The thing that will improve living conditions is a threat to financial stability, so we reject it in favor of money. If this seems too anecdotal for you, let me show you some hard data on what happens when financial incentives distort human perceptions. And Darren's going to hate me for this because I'm going to talk a lot about how incentives cause problems. In 1994, the Swiss government was trying to decide where to put a nuclear waste dump. At the time, nuclear was seen as a socially conscious alternative to fossil fuels. Now, as an aside, we here in TZM know that there are much better alternatives for renewable energy, but at the time, nuclear was the socially conscious thing to do. Three economists, Bruno Frey, Felix Oberholzer-G, and Reiner Eichenberger, went around polling the citizens of a small town in central Switzerland. They asked one simple question. Would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Astonishingly, 50% of the people surveyed said yes. They knew it was dangerous. They knew it would trash their property values, but they were willing to do it anyway because they had responsibilities as citizens and they wanted to act in the best interest of their nation and their community. Some weeks later, our three economists returned to that town with a different question. This time they asked, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community if we paid you six weeks salary every year? Now, you would think that if 50% of people were willing to do this for no compensation whatsoever, that the addition of a financial incentive would only make more people willing to comply. But it turns out the exact opposite is true. This time around, only 25% of people said yes. Now, why is that the case? The addition of a financial incentive changed the issue from one of personal responsibility to one of personal gain. Instead of asking themselves, what is best for my community, people started asking whether the six-week salary was worth the problem of having a nuclear waste dump, whether it was personally beneficial for them to do this. To quote the research, the economic analysis also confirms that compensation crowds out public spirit. The support for nuclear energy and the acceptance of the current siting procedure, both indications of the willingness to contribute to the public good, ceased to muster support once financial incentives had been introduced. In short, you can't appeal to self-interest if what you want is socially conscious behavior. 
And in addition to that, we can study the way incentives affect our tolerance for risk. Three World Bank economists, Sean Cole, Martin Kantz, and Leora Clapper, conducted research on this subject. They asked 209 loan officers in India to evaluate loan applications. Some of the officers were given high rewards and steep punishments for loans that did well or performed poorly. Others were given small rewards and small punishments. And a third group was offered a commission for every loan they signed, regardless of how it performed. The results? The high-stakes lenders tended to be the most cautious, no surprise there. The officers who received a commission for every loan they signed, however, had a tendency to overestimate the performance of each loan. To quote the research again, we find strong evidence that the structure of performance incentives distorts the subjective assessment of credit risk. Loan officers facing incentives that reward origination inflate internal ratings of loan performance by as much as 0.16 standard deviations. Incentives that reward origination do not merely affect the propensity to take on risk, but in fact distort loan officer judgment and the perception of credit risk. What this means is that it is not simply a case of loan officers being willing to take on riskier ventures for profit. Rather, they thought that those loans, which were going to perform badly, were more worthy of being taken on. If that's not enough for you, let's look at the results of a rigged game of Monopoly. Paul Piff, a professor of psychology at UC Irvine, wanted to study the effects of differential advantage on human behavior. He had several hundred students play Monopoly in a series of repeated trials. Each game began with one player holding twice as much cash as his opponent. Rich players collected twice as much money every time they passed go, and they were allowed to roll two dice instead of one. The results? Within a matter of minutes, the rich players started to display aggressive behavior. They cheered, they threw their fists in the air, they gloated over their opponents. They also adopted dominant body language. And, unsurprisingly, they hoarded all the snacks. <laughs> but that's not the most interesting aspect. The most interesting aspect is the cognitive changes that differential advantage causes. Piff eventually asked the players why they had won or why they had lost. And when the rich players were asked why they won the game, they inevitably talked about savvy business decisions and good strategy. In other words, despite knowing that they started the game with a much better position than their opponents, despite knowing that the game was rigged from the outset, they genuinely believed that they won because they had earned it. The rich players' understanding of the situation was completely warped. After the game, they talked about how they'd earned their success even though the game was blatantly rigged and their win should have been seen as inevitable. So let's review. Financial incentives make us less inclined towards socially conscious behavior. Certain types of incentives can increase our tolerance for risk and differential advantage in the form of wealth makes us less empathetic, more aggressive, and more prone to believing that we deserved unearned success. The conclusion. The market is not just an outgrowth of human psychology, it shapes human psychology. Now, I want to make sure that we're clear on this point. I am not saying that human beings were perfectly pure angels before the big bad market came along and corrupted them. Human beings are capable of a wide range of behavior. The market simply disposes them in an antisocial direction. I'm reminded of a parable told by Chief Sitting Bull. He said, inside me there are two dogs. One is good and one is evil and they fight. Which one wins? Whichever one I feed the most. The market feeds the evil dog while starving the good one. Part two, our loss of moral agency. There are three major theories of ethics. They are deontology, consequentialism, and virtue ethics. Deontology is the theory that a decision is correct if the decision maker had good intentions consequentialism, that a decision is correct if it leads to a positive outcome, and virtue ethics says that a decision is correct if it embodies virtuous characteristics. Now, I don't expect you to earn a degree in philosophy here. What I am trying to tell you is that all of these philosophies share one common thing. They are all rooted in the idea that people are responsible for their own choices and decisions. However, in light of the subtle psychological influences that we have just seen, the ways that the world shapes us that we don't even understand, 
is this realistic? Let's talk about those loan officers. In fact, let's go one step further and talk about Wall Street in 2008 and apply what we've just learned. Differential advantage stifles our capacity for empathy. Certain incentives increase our tolerance for risk. That being the case, is it any surprise that we saw aggressive lending, reckless spending, and an inevitable financial collapse? It shouldn't be, because we here in TZM learn to look at the world through a systemic lens and ask how the system influences our behavior. Psychological influence is one consideration. Another is a phenomenon that I call structural coercion. Structural coercion is the inability to make a moral choice because the system has removed all good options and you can only choose between one unethical course of action and another unethical course of action. Let me give you an example. How many people know this guy? Hands up. Okay, great, great. So in his very first song, Aladdin tells us why he does what he does. Why he goes around the city stealing bread and fruit and using that to sometimes feed children. He summarizes his problem in one line. Gotta eat to live, gotta steal to eat, otherwise we'd get along. Aladdin is faced with two horrible choices. He can either steal, which would be a violation of his ethics, or he can allow himself to starve, which would also be a violation of his ethics. No matter what he does, he can't make a good choice. And many of us find ourselves in similar situations. Why do we submit to corporate power, even when it violates our ethics? Even when we know that what they're doing is wrong? Because we'll be fired if we don't. And then we will no longer have access to life-sustaining resources. The ultimate tool to coerce conformity, to enforce subordination to corporate power, is the threat of starvation. We seldom talk about it openly, but the so-called free market is anything but. It is a system designed to contain human behavior within very narrow parameters. And there are steep consequences for those who challenge power. If you don't believe me, let me introduce you to Linda Altmont. This woman was a former executive for J.P. Morgan Chase and one very brave soul who deserves your respect. She led a team of employees who examined written off credit card debt before it was sold to debt buyers. One day in 2009, she presented her supervisors with a laundry list of compliance issues, including inaccurate or missing records, auto-signed affidavits, and accounts that were impossible to reconcile. Essentially, what Chase was doing was trying to cover up the fact that the debt that they intended to sell had either been settled or dismissed in court, meaning it was worthless. They were trying to sell a worthless product. What happened to Altmont? Well, she was fired, but it didn't end there. Reporters descended on her home, and Chase hired a, uh, an army of investigators to dig up dirt on her. I would like to read you some of Linda's story in her own words. This is from an article she wrote for Crack.com. At one point, we ended up renting a house in Florida with an abandoned house across the street. The day after we moved in, some guy came to rent the empty house. He never moved any furniture, but suddenly a forest of antennas sprouted from the roof. Isn't it good to know that while your bank can't put you on the phone with a human being in under an hour, they can have PIs watching your house in less than a day. Our house was broken into three times, once with me home. I guess they assumed that since all the cars were gone, no one was there. I was in the garage doing laundry. Then I walked into the kitchen and the guy from the house across the street was there. He looked around for a bit, then bent over, picked up my toy poodle, and claimed that he'd found it under his car. Linda was unable to take her family on a simple vacation to Disneyland. Why? Because the PIs and the paparazzi followed her everywhere. Her family began to complain of the stress of living under constant surveillance. What would cause someone to behave in this way? The corporations, I mean, not Linda. Uh, what would cause them to behave in this way? Possibly psychopathy. Paul Bibiak, C.S. Newman, and Robert D. Hare, the latter of whom developed the Hare Psychopathy Checklist, studied a sample of 203 business executives and found that roughly 3% of them scored within the psychopathic range. To give you a contrast, the average incidence of psychopathy in the general population is 1%. This means you are three times more likely to find a psychopath in a corporate boardroom 
then you are simply walking down the average city street. And if this isn't proof enough for you, Forbes celebrates the issue. I, can we just take one moment here and look at this title? Why some psychopaths make great CEOs as if he wanted to say why psychopaths, but his editors made him tone it down a little bit because the sum is in brackets. Incidentally, see that man pictured on the right? That's John Ronson. He wrote a book about corporate psychopathy. The author of this article, picture on the left, asked Ronson a question. Maybe there's a midpoint, he said. Some place on the spectrum between full psychopathy and normal behavior that's most conducive to business. And would you like to know how Ronson answered? That's possible. Obviously, there are some items on the checklist you don't want to have if you're a boss. You don't want poor behavioral control. It'd be better if you don't have promiscuous behavior. It'd be better if you don't have serious behavioral problems as a child, because that will come out. But you do want lack of empathy, lack of remorse, glibness, superficial charm, and manipulativeness. Way to stay classy, huh? In capitalism, we do not simply tolerate the existence of antisocial behavior. We actively celebrate it. And if you want another example of a new abuse of power, did you know that corporations have started blacklisting applicants? People that they will never hire because reasons. And what might get you on such a list? Well, too many job applications, of course because too many applications to the same company makes you look desperate, and we don't want desperate people working here. Let's just take a second and examine the contradiction involved here. On the one hand, if you're a job seeker, you have society telling you, get out there, send as many resumes as possible, get apply to as many positions as possible, and remember, you're probably going to apply to things in your own field, which means you're probably going to apply to the same companies multiple times. But at the same time, don't make too many applications, because if you do that, we might put you on our blacklist. Oh, and uh, if we do that, we'll tell all our friends about it so that they won't hire you either. This is an article from the Wall Street Journal. At a networking event last August in Bellevue, Wash, a recruiter, pointed to a software developer across the room. He's qualified, but very bad in his presentation skills, he told career coach Paul Anderson and a human resources official from a big technology concern. What's the guy's name, Mr. Anderson remembers the HR official asking. I want to add him to our blacklist. The developer then walked over to the trio to inquire whether the recruiter had found relevant openings, and the recruiter replied that he was still looking. But once the job seeker left, the recruiter told us he would never submit him to any clients. In other words, he just lied to the job seeker's face. And it's not enough that we're not going to hire him for something as vague as presentation skills. Does anyone have an understanding of what that means? Because I don't know how it applies to software development. It's not enough that we're not going to hire him. On top of that, we're going to gossip about it behind his back. This is a flagrant abuse of power. And if that's not enough, perhaps we should consider the story of Elizabeth Taft, the young fast food employee who was fired for being violently ill. She was working at a Subway sandwich shop in Houston when she became ill. After several trips to the restroom, she asked her supervisor to go home early and was told that she would be fired if she did not complete her shift. She passed out on the lawn in front of the, uh, in front of the subway during her break, and an employee from a nearby pizza hut found her and called an ambulance. Taft was taken to the hospital, and then she was fired for being sick. Now let's consider, in the light of structural coercion, the factors that might make someone do something like this. Why would her supervisor behave in this way? Well, the honest to God answer is that the supervisor would likely have been fired herself if she had done the sensible thing and let Taft go home. The fact that Taft would likely make the customer sick didn't matter. The fact that working while ill is incredibly painful, and even possibly dangerous in some cases, didn't matter. Concern for other people didn't matter. Because if Taft's supervisor let Taft go home, if that happened, it would send the message 
that there are some concerns more important than a company's ability to make profit. So under the current free market paradigm, the only thing that matters is subservience to corporate doctrine, subordination to power. Conclusions. There can be no moral agency in a system where survival is dependent on appeasing those with no concern for fellow human beings. Like Aladdin, we are faced with two terrible choices. We can either conform to a doctrine that is absolutely brutal in its treatment of other people, or we can elect to cut ourselves off from life-sustaining resources. We can essentially starve if we don't conform. Let me offer you a third option. Dismantle the capitalist system, throw it on the scrap heap of history where it belongs, and put in its place a system that makes public health and human well-being a priority. A system that cares about the environment, that makes sure that people get guaranteed access to food, clean water, medicine, education, shelter, and all the basic necessities of life. There is only one such system in existence today, the natural law resource-based economy. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope you have a wonderful Zeitgeist Day.